Hey everyone, Matt Baird here, host of the ATA Podcast. Coming to you with a bit of a cold today, but it's a special day and the show must go on. Quick note before we get started. If you're a first time listener, then welcome. Thanks so much for tuning in. This episode is designed for you. It's kind of a translation and interpreting 101. If you're a working translator or interpreter, consider it a review session and just sit back and enjoy. If you're interested in getting into the professions, don't sit in the back of the class and start chatting with your friends, because you're likely to miss something important. And if you don't know much about the translation and interpreting industry, if you've ever wondered what exactly do translators and interpreters do, then get out your pens and paper and take some notes. There'll be a quiz at the end. Okay, I'm kidding about the quiz. But we are going to take you behind the scenes and give you an inside look at what a day in the life of a translator or interpreter might look like. So pay attention. Spoiler alert, there's really no typical day. That's one of the things that keeps our professions so interesting and exciting. All right, let's start the show. Welcome to the ATA Podcast. I'm your host, Matt Baird, and you're listening to episode 37. Each month on the podcast, we bring you news and insights from the American Translators Association. Today, we're celebrating International Translation Day, September 30th. This is our day. And to mark the occasion, we thought it would be great to give people some insights into the worlds of translation and interpreting. This podcast complements a short video ATA is releasing that takes viewers through a day in the life of a translator or interpreter. Find a link to that video in the show notes or check out the hashtags International Translation Day or ATA ITD 2019 on social. You'll find the video on all ATA social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, Pinterest, and YouTube. Yes, we are on all of them. So please help us spread the word by sharing the video and this podcast with your family, friends, colleagues, and clients. The American Translators Association is the voice of interpreters and translators. It was founded to advance the translation and interpreting professions and foster the professional development of individual translators and interpreters, like me, for example. We have over 10,000 members in more than 100 countries, making us one of the largest organizations for language professionals in the world. And our members are not just translators and interpreters. They are teachers, project managers, web and software developers, language company owners. They work in hospitals, universities, and government agencies. These are language professionals working across a wide range of fields. Now, translators and interpreters often work behind the scenes, which is one of the reasons why many people don't really know what we do. In a moment, I'll bring on today's guest, who's going to help me draw back the curtains and take you backstage. But first, a few quick announcements. There's never been a better time to join the American Translators Association. Right now, if you join ATA for the year 2020, you'll get the rest of 2019 absolutely free. That's right, 15 months for the price of 12. Don't wait. The demand for translators and interpreters is growing, but finding quality jobs remains a big challenge. The market power of ATA membership can make the difference. Learn more on ATA's website, atanet.org. Also, are you looking for more information about the translation and interpreting professions? ATA's website provides a wealth of resources. Learn about the wide range of careers that await language professionals. Whether you're a student, a graduate, or a working professional, you'll find loads of information on how to get started, not to mention a special blog for newcomers written by working translators and interpreters. Go to atanet.org or contact ATA's headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia for support. And finally, an announcement for ATA members. Every month, members get free access to one ATA webinar. The free webinar in October is called Killer Networking Skills for Language Industry Professionals. Find out how to develop the skills that will let you make the most of every networking opportunity in a style that's all your own. 
You'll find a link to the webinar in the members only section of the ATA website, the latest ATA news briefs, and in this episode's notes. For more information on each of these announcements and more, look for links in this episode's notes. Joining me today is Judy Jenner. Judy is a longtime translator interpreter. She's an author and a sought after speaker, and she is also an ATA spokesperson. Judy, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me, Matt. It's a pleasure. All right. It's really great to have you on. Now, most of our listeners probably don't know, but I know that you travel a lot. You're as an interpreter, as a speaker, as ATA spokesperson. I remember even there, even Southwest Airlines profiled you a while back on their onboard magazine. Magazine. So, I mean, you're, you're definitely a frequent flyer. So, you're out and about. You're talking to a lot of people. What would you say is the biggest misconception you hear about translators or interpreters? Oh, good, good question. Um, I do indeed fly a lot. You're absolutely right. I fly mostly Southwest, and mm-hmm. uh, that that article and the and the and their magazine was kind of a lucky coincidence. I just pointed out to them once that. Uh, it seemed that they were always profiling these frequent flyers that Mm -hmm. tended to be men and tended to be in the software industry. Mm -hmm. So I I once mentioned to them, I think it was just a tweet saying, Hey, you know, have you considered maybe featuring more women and maybe in professions that are a little bit different Mm -hmm. than software. And they basically said, ah, good point, but didn't really get into it. And and then a few months later they said, Hey, how about we profile you? And I said, well, I wasn't really talking about myself. I was just talking about a woman. And they said, well, actually, you sound really interesting. And what you do? And I thought, well, this is an incredible opportunity to talk about translation and interpreting and to get it into this major publication. Um, So, of course, I mentioned my role as ATA spokesperson. I thought Mm -hmm. it was a really cool article. Uh, But to, to answer your question about the flying and the questions that I get. Yes, I absolutely take every opportunity that I get to talk about what I do, what we do, what translation and interpreting are all about. Mm-hmm. And boy, the misconceptions are so uh, so many. Uh, where do I start? Perhaps a question I get often is how many languages I personally speak, which kind of goes to the misconception that all translators have multiple languages. Mm-hmm. You know, all you really need is two. And um, also it, it kind of goes to the point that the public always thinks about translation, especially as something having to do with speaking a language when it really doesn't have anything to do with speaking the source language mm-hmm. well or not well. And most Most translators do, but it's not a requirement. It's all about writing exceptionally well in the target language. Mm -hmm. That's one of them. And then that um, you can pretty much translate anything, that there is no such thing as specialization. Mm -hmm. I get that question a lot. So you translate everything. And I say, no, absolutely not. Just like... (laughs) Just like attorneys don't work on everything and doctors specialize, um, translators specialize as well. Mm -hmm. And then the most frequent one I probably get is this general confusion about translation versus interpreting and if translators and interpreters do the same thing. But mostly people just call interpreters translators. So I take the opportunity to do some some client or education or public education and try not to be too annoying about it. But mm-hmm. clarifying this point is one of my very favorite things to do on airplanes and elsewhere. Well, that's great because that's actually my first question. Um, All right. Because I want to, you know, this podcast is designed to uh, talk to people who may not know a lot about our profession. So let's start with the, the basics, so to speak. Um, what's the difference between a translator and an interpreter? It's actually very, very simple, and it can be explained in a sentence or two. So translation has to do with a written word. So Mm -hmm. translators uh, convey, transfer meaning from one language to the other in writing. And interpreters do it while talking. It's uh, an oral form of communication. So something that I like to tell people to make this easy, I say if you're looking 
at the person who is providing the language services, then it's probably an interpreter because mm -hmm. he or she is standing either right there in court or sitting next to you in a business meeting, or you can see them in the back of the room during a big conference. But if you're not looking at the, at the linguist, if you're reading something, then mm -hmm. that's, that's translators, right? The translation is always in writing interpreting is always spoken and interestingly enough nobody really ever calls translators interpreters mm -hmm. but the other way around happens all the time have you noticed that that interpreters yes. get called translators but not vice versa i don't know why <laughs> but, yeah it's a good it's a good question um if i had to guess right here on the spot i would say that the word translation or translator is just more common and and more well known than the word interpreter um, mm -hmm. that, it's, that it's kind of a foreign word to some people who, who, who uh, aren't familiar with the profession. Yeah, I agree. I think it's an important distinction. Uh, some may say, well, let's not insist on, the, on these terms, but there are different skills, there are different professions, and I think it's important to differentiate again uh, among them. And I think every time we have an opportunity to speak about uh, our profession, our industry, to anybody in the, in the public, uh, general public, who may not know that much about this profession yet the better and this this is a mm -hmm. good starting point and many people say well thank you for explaining that to me i've always won wondered and um this is really interesting and i usually tell them knowing this will make you smarter than 99 percent of the population <laughs> <laughs> they, they usually like that so it's also sort of a playful way to to get people interested in yeah. what do we do because what we do is very important and a lot of people don't often think about it yeah, and they're two totally different, you know, art forms, so to speak. I know that I have never interpreted, and any time I've maybe, uh, while watching TV, thought I'm just try it and see what it's like, I've always failed miserably. It's a learned, it's a learned craft, and Absolutely. I don't think everybody can do it. And and the same for translation. I know I know some interpreters that say like they don't they don't want to sit in a room and translate um, on paper and get every word perfect and and on all that. They want to interact with people and help people, two people sitting in a room who can't talk to each other. They want to help them communicate. And it's, it's really two different skill sets. Absolutely. They both have to do with language, of course, but it's the difference essentially between writing and speaking. Right. If you just break it down to an example that anybody can understand, just like writers aren't necessarily actors or speakers, um, that's pretty much the same thing. Right. It's a, we, they both work with language, but it's a completely different skill. And while some some linguists are both translators and, and interpreters, like that's the category I fall in, uh, many are not. Just like you said, you you're a translator, and that's that's what you do. And I know plenty of translators who never would think even for a second about interpreting as a career mm -hmm. because they are they excel in the writing and writing that the written word is their their medium mm -hmm. and I, I personally like doing both there's something very fascinating about uh, about oral communication about how ephemeral it is and how immediate it is and how gratifying it is too to establish that communication like you mentioned mm -hmm. and Translation is a completely different uh, different world. You have more time, but you're usually by yourself, so you don't see sort of the immediate effect of, of the communication that you're enabling. So, Judy, who do translators and interpreters work for? Another great question, and I'll, I'll explain it briefly, but it's, it's very similar to, to other industries in many ways. So, there are in-house position, positions for both interpreters and translators in a very wide variety of uh, fields and settings for you know, public agencies and organizations and private companies, etc. So those are considered the in-house positions for translators or interpreters. Mm -hmm. um, but the vast majority of interpreters and translators in the world tend to be self-employed freelancers, mm -hmm. meaning, meaning that they have multiple clients, oftentimes uh, in multiple countries, different time zones, and they contract as needed either with uh, with direct clients or with language services companies that uh, need translators or interpreters or 
individuals. So it's a translation and interpreting is a very, very big field with a lot of different setups. Um, I have personally both been an in-house translator and self-employed, uh, mm-hmm. been running my own small business for a, a long time now. <laughs> and uh, they both have their advantages for sure. And I would say just anecdotally here in the U.S., we tend to have fewer uh, staff or employees in terms of translation and interpreting than we do, for example, in Europe, where there's a Mm -hmm. bit more of a tradition of that. Okay. It is, it is a, a, a large industry. It's sort of this hidden, hidden industry. Now, what does it take to become a translator or interpreter? Can any bilingual person do it? Uh, the short answer is no, absolutely not. <laughs> and and I'll, I'll get a little bit more into that. But to your previous point about how big this industry is, yes, absolutely. Depending on which uh, number, metric, or research you, you look at, the size of this industry is some $47 billion mm-hmm. annually, which is an incredibly large number that I can't quite yes. wrap my brain around. Yeah. <laughs> and it includes all kinds of interpreting and translation, things you'd never think about, such as military interpreting, software localization, localization of video games, book mm-hmm. translation. There's Our industry is so diverse and interesting, and a lot of people never really think about it, even mm-hmm. though we we make uh, we help make global commerce and diplomacy happen. So yes. back, back to your question about uh, if any bilingual person can be a translator or interpreter. No, this is a profession, just like anything else, like any other profession. You need some base skills, and then you need to build on them. Mm-hmm. But saying, saying that being bilingual makes you an interpreter or a translator is similar to saying having two hands makes you a piano player. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's more of a minimum requirement, right? Yeah, uh, you, need, yeah. you need to know those two languages. That's the minimum requirement. To say that qualifies you is a misconception that I would love mm-hmm. to, um, to get rid of because that creates a lot of confusion also for new students, right, who enroll in these programs and think, well... I'm bilingual, I'm done. And then they get into the, uh, the nitty gritty of translation and they realize that they, they do meet the minimum requirement, but there's a, a long way to go. So mm-hmm. you need, you know, to be a translator, you need obviously incredible writing skills in the target language. Mm-hmm. Translators usually translate into their, their aid language or their strongest language. So I, I, what I ask my students, because I have the pleasure of teaching translation and interpreting as an adjunct at the University of California, San Diego, mm-hmm. I, I ask them some really simple questions to, to see if they've really thought of translation. So I ask them, for example, um, do people tell you all the time that you're an incredible writer? And most mm-hmm. people will say, well, no, no, not really. And I said, well, are you, were you the kid in school uh, that everybody went to when they wanted an essay written or a love letter or they, they wanted someone to edit their work? Were you, were you that person? And a lot of people sort of say no. And I'm trying to mm-hmm. use a Socratic method to get students to sort of understand whether they're qualified for this industry, which I think is a pretty good approach. What, what do you think? I think these are good questions. Mm-hmm. So and a, lot, a lot of them will say, you know, I haven't really thought about the fact that translators are essentially writers. They thought translation just has something to do with language and I'm bilingual, therefore I am, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. So it takes, of course, a lot more than that. And on the, on the interpreting side, well, for both translation and interpreting, you need a lot of special skills that go way beyond knowing a second language or a third language. You need subject matter expertise and you need insight into the industries in which you work Uh, Mm -hmm. and you need some very specific skills for example in interpreting it's uh, if you're a simultaneous interpreter you have to deal with stress that you may have never been exposed to Mm -hmm. and and interpreting in a simultaneous mode meaning that you speak at this you interpret at the same time as the speaker Mm -hmm. speaking just with a few seconds delay 
behind him or her. This act of uh, absorbing information, of listening, of converting, of analyzing, of finding the equivalent, and then interpreting, speaking all in real time Mm -hmm. seems entirely impossible to any beginner. Actually, it seems completely impossible to me. It still fascinates me, (laughs) and I've been a translator for 20 plus years. Good point. Yes, exactly. Even folks like you who are so connected and they're very much in our business, interpreting is one of these sort of strange phenomena that you're like, wow, is it really possible? But it is one of the most difficult things cognitively that the human Mm -hmm. brain can do. So if you want to be an interpreter, you do need, of course, top-notch language skills in in, in both languages and and spoken, right? Your Mm -hmm. written abilities don't matter if you are an interpreter because what you're doing is entirely spoken but you have to withstand stress you have to work well under pressure interpreting is really a way, in, in a way a performance art at some point if you're a translator you usually have time to think about things you have a comfortable working environment mm-hmm. you may have unreasonable deadlines but you're not very exposed you're not in front of the room where mm-hmm. everybody looks at you so those are some some things to think about of course there are many many others but um, to circle it back around uh, being bilingual or knowing two languages at least is the minimal requirement that you need to be a translator or interpreter and then there's a lot a lot of work to be done af- beyond that now, you mentioned subject matter expertise, and earlier you, you mentioned that, like in other professions, um, we don't just translate, interpret everything. Um, we typically, we tend to work in certain fields that we are specialized in. Um, why is that important? Why should someone who's hiring a translator or an interpreter um, want to hire a specialist? Uh, yes, good question again. These are all such great questions. I love, I'm loving this. <laughs> um, well, because just simply put, uh, translators and interpreters can't know everything. It's impossible. And I like to make this analogy w- with, with legal services, right? If you're an mm-hmm. attorney, uh, there's pretty much no law firm in the country that I know of that says we do everything from criminal law to civil law to uh, international law to contracts to torts to uh, constitutional law. I mean, it's just not possible. You can't have expertise, or at least real expertise, in that many fields. Mm-hmm. And translation and interpreting is the same. For, for instance, I have a great colleague who has a PhD in physics, mm-hmm. and she, she is the ideal person to translate physics textbooks mm-hmm. uh, from, from English into German or, or vice versa, right? And I, if you give me a physics text, um, I am not qualified to translate it because I don't understand it, and that's not my specialization. So the first step in translation and interpreting is always understanding the source, whether yes. it's in, in writing or oral, right? If you don't understand it, then we're done. There will be no communication happening. Mm-hmm. So that's why translators and interpreters specialize, uh, because you need to invest in that field. For me personally, it's e-commerce, marketing, and, and legal, and mm-hmm. those are the fields that I that I enjoy, that I have quite deep knowledge in. And I turn down other texts that are outside those areas of specialization because I won't be doing a good job at it. Mm-hmm. It's a question of ethics, of professional awareness. Mm-hmm. Luckily, as, as a member of the ATA, I know thousands of fantastic translators and interpreters all over the world. So if a client says, I need this physics text translated, I said, Mm -hmm. I will say I'm personally unable to do it. And sometimes I explain a little bit about why that is just Mm -hmm. so people get more of an understanding. And then I say, of course, I want to want to help you solve your problem, Mm -hmm. which is your problem is you need this in another language. Mm -hmm. So I will give you the name of somebody who can do that and who's going to be fantastic at it. And then everybody's happy. <laughs> right on. It's happened to me 
uh, to me as well. I wouldn't touch physics or chemistry or mechanical engineering with a with a ten foot pole. <laughs> <laughs> I hear you, but luckily yeah. there's colleagues there's who are specialized. plenty of colleagues who <laughs> who specialize in those very same uh, subjects. You just need to find them. Um, now, uh, Judy, when I told my parents a long time ago now, uh, when, that I was going to become a freelance translator. I remember my mom looked at me a little concerned and, and said, can you make a living doing that? <laughs> and, uh, so that's my question to you and for our listeners, can you make a real career out of translation interpreting? Uh, yes. The short answer is yes. And allow me to elaborate a bit on that. And I, I like the story you just told about your parents. Um, I think there have been so many misconceptions about our profession. And oftentimes, I think when you say initially translator, mm-hmm. a lot of people envision literary translation for some mm-hmm. reason. I don't know if you've noticed that. that yes. They, they think you're going to translate Tolstoy or or Thomas Mann. And uh, literary <laughs> translation is, of course, uh, an important part of our profession, but it's I wouldn't say it's the dominant one. And mm-hmm. I don't do any literature translation anyway. But at least it's good that people have some sort of association when they hear translation. Oftentimes, they think literature. Mm-hmm. So yes, you can make a living. Um, I, I'm living proof, and you are living proof. Yes. And uh, the members of the ATA and the thousands of successful translators and interpreters around the world are living proof that it is a profession uh, that's viable, that's growing, and um, that the expected job growth is around 18% uh, in the next decade or so, which is faster than than average for all occupations. And this is data here for the U.S., by the way. Mm -hmm. It's very much a a global business, but in in Mm -hmm. terms of the U.S., I think that's a strong number. Mm -hmm. But of course, you know, making a a living, especially if you decide to go the freelance route, takes a lot of work, a lot of effort, um, it takes investment in your skills, investment in your learning, and uh, the ability to, to take on some risk. Uh, running a small business, being a freelance translator or interpreter, means that you don't have uh, a steady paycheck. So you have mm-hmm. to find those clients, you have to have an online presence, you have to network, you have to go out there and, uh, and find the work, which is, it allows you an incredible amount of freedom and flexibility in your personal life. Mm-hmm. But of course, it's always a risk. And the flip side is you could uh, look for those in-house translation interpreting positions which you know are a smaller part of the of the profession here in the US they mm-hmm. they do exist especially on the court for court interpreting i oftentimes get job announcements for in-house court interpreters at mm-hmm. the federal at the federal level because there are several um, certifications for court interpreters in this country mm-hmm. and uh, I'm in the lucky position to hold um, the highest one, which is a federal certification for Spanish court interpreters. Mm-hmm. And, and there's a big need that's a, a growing portion of our, our market, court interpreting. And I oftentimes get these job announcements for to be an in-house uh, uh, interpreter for the United States courts somewhere around the country. But, mm-hmm. you know, I, I really enjoy running my own business. And uh, But those are some great positions for people who want to be in-house. So mm-hmm. yes, it's possible to make a career, but just like in every profession, uh, you need to invest and you need to, to learn and, and to grow. And the beginning may be challenging, mm-hmm. but I, I think we're so lucky that we have organizations like the American Translators Association, which pro- provides so, so many resources on their website. And there's the, the annual conference, there's a magazine, there's mm-hmm. webinars. So there really is so much more information out there about how to get started in this business than when when my twin sister and I started our small business almost 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. There really wasn't that much information. And, and for those of you who are younger, I mean, I, I went to college with no internet. <laughs> so <laughs> so I, things were a lot more difficult back then. It's definitely easier to get started and to find out about how everything works now than it was even 10, 15 years ago. Uh, yes, I'm uh, right there with you, Judy. <laughs> now, 
Um, we're dating ourselves here. <laughs> yeah. uh, now let's talk about translators specifically for a moment. Um, what's a day in the life of a typical translator? What, what does that look like? Well, there are no typical translators and, and by extension, no, no typical days, really. Mm-hmm. We are such a diverse group. We, we work in so many different settings and different projects, of course, different languages. Um, so it could be a variety of things. Um, for example, for me, I'm a, I'm a freelancer. I have a a shared office downtown, but also I also have a home office. So a lot of my work happens from those two locations, mm-hmm. but I'm also on the road a lot. So I answer emails, I work on translations, I coordinate projects at, uh, at airport lounges in <laughs> hotel rooms, uh, mm-hmm. sometimes even, even on the train, whatever it takes. This is mm-hmm. a very global economy that we're part of that moves very fast and mm-hmm. As I mentioned earlier, many of us have clients in different time zones and different countries. So we try to make everybody happy while coordinating our schedules. And, you know, I think translation is a lot about being on top of your schedule too and making sure you get the right time zone as well. If your client says this is due 5 p.m., mm-hmm. you have to ask the important question, which time zone is five? five which time zone are you talking about? Um, other translators are completely different. They mm-hmm. go, they are employees either for translation agencies, or also known as language services providers. So they're in house or they work for international companies. Some big international companies will have in house translation departments, mm-hmm. and that's where translators can work, for example, and there could be communications, marketing firms, all kinds of, all kinds of options, Just maybe advertising agencies, and they will go to work in the morning and they will be at their employment and they'll work for that one client. And when you're a freelancer, it's very typical that you work for a variety of clients every day. For mm-hmm. example, it could be the law firms, the governments, um, multinational corporations, organizations, translation agencies, you name it. So, so for me today, uh, I'm in New York right now. I have a conference call later with one of my clients in the financial services industry. Mm-hmm. So we'll talk about some upcoming marketing translations that we have. Then I'll have a brainstorming session with um, a few of my freelance um, translators who work with me and project-based, and mm-hmm. we'll talk about how we can make this project happen for, for this client. Mm-hmm. Then I have to turn in some translations to, uh, to another client that's, um, that's in the, well, they're, they're, they're a law firm, really, that represents mm-hmm. a lot of clients in, in Las Vegas where, where I work. And so just to give you an example of the variety of things I have to do, and um, the last thing I have to do today is send uh, invoices for the, for the work that we have performed this week for our clients. So mm-hmm. hopefully that gives you a little bit of sort of insight of what my typical day looks like, which mm-hmm. is not always typical. Um, but uh, again, it's such a, such a wide variety of things that we do, which I think makes this, this industry, this profession so exciting. It's never, never the same. And uh, we're, we are very much part of making the economy work. Uh, we're sort of behind the scenes a lot, mm-hmm. but I think it's, it's important to shine a spotlight occasionally on the people who are behind all these magical languages. So to say. Yeah, I know a lot of translators I talk to, and of course I talk to a lot of translators, um, talk about the, how they love the learning aspect of the job because they are doing different things every day. They're seeing different texts. They might be working in a specific field, but they might be seeing different types of texts or they might have several specializations and, and they're just, you feel like you're constantly learning because what a text you get, you have to do some research on it. You're not going to understand every aspect. There might be a term in there you haven't seen before. Um, so you've got this research and learning aspect to it uh that that's that's definitely a part of of every translator's day um, yes absolutely and i, I agree 100 percent. it keeps you on your toes it keeps you challenged it keeps you engaged i i really like that very much that it's never really that repetitive right that there's different projects i work on of course we translate for example a lot of contracts right so mm-hmm. contracts tend to be relatively similar so there's
there's less of a learning opportunity there. But just to give an example that may be interesting in this context, um, as an interpreter, uh, you are more confronted with areas of specialization that may be a little bit new than mm-hmm. on the translation side. Because mm-hmm. with interpreting, oftentimes a client will say, oh, this is very general. Don't worry about it. And they won't have more information and you get there and it's, you know, um, computer assisted robotics surgery, <laughs> which, <laughs> you know, of course you, you need to, as an interpreter, it's your job to ask ahead of time what the project is about to get a lot of information to prepare. But mm-hmm. in real life, that's not always how it mm-hmm. works. Sometimes you have to deal with limited information, with incomplete information. That's the life of an interpreter. Mm-hmm. And um, recently, one of my clients, uh, a new client actually, approached me about doing some interpreting for a video game. Mm-hmm. And, um, I, and I said truthfully that you know I don't know much about video games in general, especially uh, not about this one in particular. And I said, well, we'll send you some materials. Do you feel comfortable reading up on this and learning the terminology. And I thought, well, it's not my area of specialization, but this is something relatively narrow that I believe Mm -hmm. I can learn in the next few days. Um, And I I downloaded the game. I I started playing it. I don't, I'm terrible at it. Uh, But I, but I learned a lot about the process, what the game looks like. And it was a competition that featured this particular game that was being interpreted, um, into German by well by me and by my business partner and my twin sister and and it went really well I really really enjoyed it and I learned a lot of new things about this video game and it's, it was really fascinating to to dive into the, this new world it mm-hmm. certainly kept me engaged it's a little scary of course every time you take on something new yeah. you should be there should be some reservation that you have but you also have to determine when is a good moment to, to sort of challenge yourself and to mm-hmm. learn something new and when can you definitely say no I, mm-hmm. I will not be able to learn enough about this to be able to be qualified right and of course i'm never suggesting that you accept any assignment that you know you're not qualified for mm-hmm. you have to use your own judgment and your ability to learn things quickly. And that oftentimes happens in interpreting that maybe you go to a conference where you've been retained to interpret one speaker and you know exactly what this person is going to talk about. But Mm -hmm. then that speaker is ill and a new speaker shows up and they talk about something completely different. You're going to have to to perform and you have to do it. It keeps you on your toes, certainly. Let's stick with the, 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 with the subject of interpreters for another moment. Um, cause you got into your kind of, uh, you know, gave us a little insight into your typical day. Um, there are lots of different interpreters, types of interpreters out there. You've got, you know, court interpreters, which is one, uh, one role that you play. You've got medical interpreters, uh, working in hospitals, making sure that doctors and patients and nurses and patients, uh, can, can speak to each other. Um, you've got conference interpreters. Uh, you just mentioned conference com- interpreters. I know there's community interpreters. You've got interpreters working in disaster areas after, after, uh, an earthquake or a flood and what have you. Um, there's so many different, uh, places that interpreters work. So as you could, we could say there's no typical day for an interpreter either, but I'm wondering if you could maybe um, tell us briefly about uh, maybe a typical day in the life of a court interpreter, because I know that's something you do a lot. Sure, absolutely. As you very well said, Matt, there's so many different settings in which interpreters work. Um, I think the vast majority of the public, probably when they, when they hear interpreter, they may envision an interpreter at the European Union mm-hmm. or the United Nations, perhaps mm-hmm. influenced by the movie The Interpreter <laughs> with Nicole Kidman. Yeah. I, I, I do think that uh, a lot of um, folks have that image in their head, which is a perfectly great image. Um, how, however, here in the U.S., court interpreting and medical interpreting are what I would say probably the, the two largest uh, areas mm-hmm. in which interpreters work. Okay. And, as you said, as a, as a court interpreter, you will be, um, depending on the language and the state, there are very, very important certifications to become mm-hmm. a court interpreter, to, to work in the courts, whether on the state level or on the federal level. And um, it gets a little complicated, so I won't go into the certification mm-hmm. versus registration, but there's there's some high standards, as as we should. We should have high standards for, for court because these are very important things that you're interpreting. So um, 
a lot of my colleagues are either exclusively court interpreters or they have both a court and a medical certification. So they'll do both. They'll <laughs> do some conference interpreting work as well. I, I do a lot of court and I do a lot of conference. Mm -hmm. Medical interpreting, I think, is a very, very important part of our industry and it's growing. But you have to ask yourself the question, do you like to be in hospitals? Do you mm -hmm. like to be surrounded um, by patients and by doctors? And I'm a little, I'm a little uncomfortable with the idea of, mm -hmm. of blood in general. That's something you have to be prepared for as a medical interpreter. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, so as a court interpreter, um, if you are an employee, then your day will consist of being in the courthouse. You may be running from one court courtroom to the next, um, mm -hmm. or you may be assigned to a particular courtroom. You may be the interpreter who's there for whenever the judge has his or her session morning sessions, afternoon sessions, it could be trials, it could be arraignments, first mm -hmm. appearances, status hearings, um, all kinds of things. It's a complex legal system that we have here in the U.S., and you could be working at something relatively simple like traffic court where uh, folks will go to uh, try to get a reduction in their in their speeding ticket, mm -hmm. <laughs> which, you know, is a relatively quick and painless process to, to pretty, pretty involved evidentiary hearings. And uh, if you're a freelancer, that's my role with the United States federal courts and also with the state courts, but much less so, mm -hmm. um, you will go, uh, they will call you, tell you, we need you to come here for this one hearing or two hearings and uh, you'll go, you'll know your assignment, you'll have your the courtroom you're going to, you'll have a little bit of information about the, about the case. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes you don't have as much as you want, but with experience, you really know what to expect. You will, mm -hmm. you, you know what's going to happen during a status hearing, right? You, you, mm -hmm. you, you, that's a lot of, uh, that's a big part of what you do as a court interpreter. You learn procedure, um, you learn how the system works and that's something you have to learn off on your own. I've taken a lot of classes at the a local community college in legal procedure, criminal, criminal procedure, civil procedure, and um, very interesting stuff. Mm -hmm. So that's how court interpreting works, but it's not all inside court. If you're a certified court interpreter, you also can work in other settings, for example, at law firms, uh, mm -hmm. something called depositions, which is usually part of the discovery period, mostly in civil cases. Mm -hmm. It's basically an interview where the parties have a chance to ask questions of each mm -hmm. other, usually of, of one party. And oftentimes there'll be Spanish speaking parties and, or another language. I always use Spanish because that's the one that I think of the most, but of course it could be a wide variety of languages and you'd be interpreting in a more informal setting, mm -hmm. usually in a, in a meeting room, sort of a, a office setting at either a law firm or a court reporting firm. And you do the interpreting there. It's um, it's outside of court, but it's still a court court proceeding. So mm -hmm. um, that's I think that's in a nutshell how court interpreting works. Of course, we could be talking about this until next yeah. year, <laughs> but it's the summary. <laughs> No, thank you very much for that. It's really, it's really interesting to get to get those insights. I've uh, personally, like I said, I've been a translator for twenty five years now, and uh, I've 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 never, you know, witnessed in person uh, a court interpreter at work. Um, All right, so, maybe maybe if you ever come no, to Vegas, we'll no, spend an to. afternoon in the courthouse. <laughs> that would be great. I'll take you up on that offer, Judy. Sounds so, great. Now, at ATA, we like to promote the message that translators and interpreters help power the global economy. Um, tell our listeners what exactly that means. Well, it means essentially that without translators and interpreters, it would be extremely difficult to have a global economy because turns out we don't speak or write the same languages. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we want to have global trade and diplomacy, we need translators and interpreters to make it happen. And it's something, again, that the general public maybe doesn't think about very often. They, they take it for granted that that process works. And before I was a translator and interpreter, I, yeah, I was probably the same way. I, I mm -hmm. bet I didn't, I didn't think about it that much, mm -hmm. you know, that how did this subtitled movie magically appear on my television, right? Yeah. And, 
And how great that I can read Stieg Larsson's work in German because I don't read Swedish or I can read it in English, right? These are mm-hmm. all parts of uh, the economy. And how great that international the dignitaries and diplomats can, can talk to each other. They mm-hmm. talk to each other through interpreters. Uh, international business meetings uh, oftentimes have interpreters. Contracts get translated. Uh, mm-hmm. uh, companies don't want to sign contracts, obviously, in a language that they cannot read because they need to know what they're agreeing to. So there, there are hundreds or probably thousands of these examples of how translation and interpreting plays such a crucial role in the global economy each and every day. And really translation and interpreting, it, uh, those things are everywhere. Uh, you just, uh, sometimes you're not aware of them. It's uh, the wine label of the bottle of yeah. wine that you may be sharing in the evening, you know, with your loved one. That, that wine that came from, come, came from France and it was, uh, was imported to the U.S. And there was a bill of lading that, mm-hmm. that got translated. There's a wine label that got mm-hmm. translated. There's probably a contract between the, the grower or the vineyard in France and the importer uh, detailing the, uh, the mm-hmm. well, the details of their, of their agreement of how this is going to work. And there's, there's translators in the middle. Maybe there was a phone call at some point yeah. between the wine grower and the importer, and maybe there was an interpreter on the line, probably. So I, I think that wine bottle example is, is uh, kind of illust- illustrates it relatively well. So yeah, we're, well, it's, we're important. <laughs> it's when well, it's also well documented that um, people like to shop in their in the in the language they feel most comfortable with, so their native language, so to speak. And yes. uh, so, if you want to sell uh, to someone who doesn't speak your language, uh, then you need to, your marketing materials, your products need to be translated into that language. Otherwise you're not going to make that sale. Uh, Absolutely. It's just a fact of life. Yes. Um, and it, as you said, it's well documented. There's you know lots of internet data you can get to see at what point customers drop out of the purchasing process, right? If they realize maybe the landing page of this website, the first page was translated, but mm-hmm. then you when you get into the purchasing process, then it's no longer translated because it's a mm-hmm. lot of work oftentimes for companies. And yeah. the, then the consumers drop out because as you as you correctly say, people prefer making purchases in their in their own language. And uh, when you make that happen, companies grow their sales. And that's, of course, a goal of every company, of every for-profit company. Mm-hmm. They want to sell more of whatever they're selling internationally because it's a global economy. And if they're a U.S.-based company, they're even... They want to sell most of their uh, most of their products abroad, right? Because America yeah. isn't that huge a part of the of the world, right? There is a big, big world out there, mm-hmm. and and we help companies achieve their sales goals and their growth goals by by doing their translations and by allowing them to reach the customers that they need to reach. That's right. Now, Judy, you and I, uh, as we mentioned before, went to college before the internet. And we both started working as translators before Google Translate and, and some of the other machine translation technologies. Um, you know, now, today, in this age of Alexa, so to speak, many people out there think that all you need is Google Translate or a smartphone app um, to translate. And, you know, there are many companies out there that just slap the Google Translate button on their website and don't give it a second thought. So my question for our audience today is, is machine translation as good as human translator? Ah, it's an important subject and we definitely need to talk about machine translation. Um, I think free MT machine translation tools are are very useful for a variety of things. Mm -hmm. To To get the gist of something, for example, you're lost on the street somewhere in a foreign country and you you know you want to uh, see how you say where is the subway in Romanian right that Mm -hmm. uh, that comes in super handy Um, but even though machine translation has gotten much 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 better in the last uh, probably three to four years with something called neural machine translation NMT Mm -hmm. we, we still need the human translators to make sure that the the message is accurate and it's nuanced and it's natural because uh, the humans, uh, the human brain is ideally suited for translation. We understand meaning and nuance and um, 
we understand intent and uh, humor and sarcasm mm -hmm. and we use our, our our great human brains to produce uh, the translation of the meaning right not just the words and humans have consistently been very good at that um, machine translation as i said is getting better there are a lot of things that are <clears throat> already getting machine translated um, so machine translation is here to stay um, translators will always i believe be part of uh, com communicating especially when it's crucial right when you mm -hmm. when you're not lost looking for the metro in romania but when you need a contract translated are you going to trust the machine with that to that or do you want do you want a, a human to do it mm. lots of food for thought there the future the future is almost here um, and we need to adapt just like every profession there will be changes but humans uh, and human translators uh, will be around in both the short uh, term and mm -hmm. the long term well we and we have adapted we're we're using Tax technology has grown over the years. You know, 30 years ago, people were uh, translating on typewriters and literally mailing the translations to their clients. And then the fax machine came about and they faxed their translations. Um, and <laughs> yes. now we're doing everything electronically. We're emailing, but we're also using, uh, you know, translation memory technology, which we can, we can integrate uh, terminology glossaries and terminology databases that we can tap into really quickly for, for terminology. And we can record our translation, so to speak, in, the, in this translation memory uh, software and then and put pull up if a, if a certain phrase uh, comes up again or even an identical sentence, we can see how we've translated that in the past. So we are using uh, uh, technology as translators, um, but we're using it to enhance uh, what we already already do uh, and, and not uh, to simply rely on it to, to uh, output something for us. Absolutely. Technology is a huge part of translation, also of interpreting, but very much of, uh, in translation. As you said, the early days in translation, I really don't know how our amazing colleagues did yeah. this 30 years ago without the internet and actually having to go to the library mm -hmm. to do research and then mailing uh, translations in a paper envelope. I, I don't know how they were able to work under those conditions. I have a lot of admiration for that. Technology surely has made our jobs better. It's made them easier. It's made our work uh, superior, right? Because as you mm -hmm. mentioned, uh, translation memories and the ability to store translations you've already done before and then find them when a similar text comes up. That's essentially how it works. Mm -hmm. it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty fantastic. It's great for quality assurance. It's great for consistency. And technology, translators and technology, we, we've pretty much always coexisted. You know, it's... Uh, some level even the fax was a technology we worked with right and, and the future will involve us being even more more connected to technology and there will continue to be a place for us as, as humans but te technology is te te technically it's always a good thing i would say we just have to to figure out exactly where we fit in and how we use it to make our, our work better and to make ourselves more productive too i use Mm -hmm. A ton of tools that that make me more productive than than without technology. Judy, one one final question now: How would someone who is isn't so familiar with the business of translation or interpreting know how to find and obtain a translator or an interpreter who is good? Yeah, that's that's an important uh, aspect of. Uh, of the buyer side, right? How mm -hmm. do you find these people? And I, I know oftentimes for the clients, so the buyer side, it's kind of scary. They don't even, they don't really know where to start. Mm -hmm. and, and I get that because oftentimes, again, folks haven't thought very much about translation. And now let's say you're the director of marketing at a medium-sized company and somebody dumps this project on your desk and says, hey, guess what? You're going to be in charge of making sure we have our website translated into five languages. And mm -hmm. they've never done it before. That happens all the time at companies that they're finally getting into translation. They want to expand. And now this poor marketing director says, oh, no, not, now what? <laughs> Where do yeah. I start? But luckily, it's actually less overwhelming than you think because uh, I think a great place to start with would be with the ATA directory. Mm -hmm. um, it's a wealth of resources on, on the website that I've mentioned before. 
atanet.org. Mm-hmm. But the most important part on that website, I believe, for the buyer side, is having this directory where they can search for a translator, in this case, also an interpreter, by language, by specialization. So if this marketing director uh, has a website that has technical content, let's say her company makes bike parts, Mm -hmm. um, and then she'll be able to sort by translators, uh, let's say from English into whichever languages she needs, and choose that specialization. And she will get a a result of translators with their contact information, and she can contact them that way. So it's really... Mm -hmm. Not as difficult as you think. I think ATA has made it made it uh, pretty pretty straightforward for for buyers to um to find those um, those translators and interpreters. Mm-hmm. Of course, uh, the, the client still has to ask um, some good questions to make mm-hmm. sure that the translator or interpreter is the right fit for them. Making sure that the translator has the right experience, education, credentials, just like you would do with really with with any profession, right? Mm -hmm. If if I'm looking for a new lawyer or a new accountant, I would probably also go to a professional association or I would ask friends and family. I'd make sure that the lawyer has passed the bar exam in the state (laughs) that I want him or her to practice. Mm -hmm. And that I'd want to know about their experience, right? If I Mm -hmm. want to hire a lawyer to to represent me in a small claims dispute that got out of hand, I want to make sure that that lawyer has a lot of experience in small claims because that's mm-hmm. what I'm going for and translation really is no exception it's just like any other any other profession where we have a lot of diversity and specializations and um and and areas of expertise right and uh, sometimes it can seem overwhelming from the buyer side but with the AT directory i think it's uh it's pretty simple so it's a great database um i i use it all the time time myself even though i have my own database of folks i work with on a regular basis but Mm -hmm. if i need to find somebody in a language that i perhaps don't use that often i will go to the AT directory and i'll plug in the the criteria that I have and up pops the list and then I usually remember oh yes I've already worked with so and so Mm -hmm. I just couldn't couldn't remember her name and there she is excellent well I hope everyone out there listening was taking notes today because we covered a lot Um, but if you weren't don't worry there are plenty of links in the show notes today to help you find more information Judy, uh, thanks so much for giving us a glimpse into the lives of translators and interpreters today. It's been a pleasure having you on the podcast. Thank you so much. I had a lot of fun. Um, I Finally, I suggest if you have any more questions about translation and interpreting, about how, how it all works, uh, contact the ATA. Check out the website, atanet.org. Okay, great. Thank you so much. You've been listening to Judy Jenner. Judy is a longtime translator, interpreter, author, and speaker. She's also an ATA spokesperson. Like Judy said, to learn more about translation and interpreting, be sure to check out ATA's website, atanet.org. You'll find lots of great information under resources. Episode 37 was produced by me with support from Mary David, ATA Assistant Executive Director for Membership and Communications. Technical and web support was provided by Rashawn Pacquerel, ATA Assistant Executive Director for IT and Operations. Mixing and editing was done by Human Factor, and the music you heard today was from bensound.com. Previous episodes of the ATA podcast can be found on ATA's website under resources, and you can subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Tuned In, and Stitcher. We announce a new episode each month in the ATA news briefs and on Facebook and Twitter, so watch your inboxes and be sure to follow ATA on social. And if you haven't already, please leave a review on iTunes or tell a colleague or friend about us. We'd really appreciate it. As always, we'd love to hear thoughts and ideas for new shows or any comments you may have about past episodes. Please write to me at podcast at atanet.org. So what's up next on the podcast? Well, with AT's 60th Annual Conference coming up in Palm Springs at the end of October, we likely won't release a podcast next month. But like last year, we're hoping to sit down with a few of the speakers while we're in Palm Springs and bring those interviews to you in the months following the conference. 
We've also got some other ideas in the works for after the conference and into the new year. So stay tuned. Speaking of the conference, I'm going to be roaming the hallways in search of more member moments. If you've got a story to share, look for me. I'll have my mic ready. Thanks for listening, everyone. Talk to you again after the conference.